everybody, welcome to this Comic-Con International Comic-Con at Home panel. I am Eric Calborn. I am a teacher on the South Side of Chicago and Art and Music Department Chair. I am a member of the organization Lit X, and we work to bring all things literature into classrooms to help teachers with pop culture from video games to music to comics and graphic novels. And that is primarily the topic of this Ask Me Anything panel we have here today. We have a star studded cast and we have questions that we collected through social media to ask these fine people about using comics and graphic novels in their classroom. We have specific questions for the creators and we have questions for teachers and administrators as well. So today we are lucky to be joined by Michael Gianfrancesco, Rano Whitaker, Jason Walls, Lisa Wu, and Lucy Nisley. I'm going to give each of them a little bit of time to introduce themselves and talk about any upcoming projects that they may have of interest to the fans out there. So Michael, why don't you kick us off? Welcome. Hi, Eric. Uh, my name is Michael G. Francisco. I'm a high school teacher and sometimes college professor in the Providence, Rhode Island area. Um, with, along with Eric and Ron Allen and others, uh, we formed the cohort Lit X, uh, teachers around the country who like to use uh, multiple te uh, diverse texts, not just your standard uh, canonical books, but also graphic novels, video games, music, movies, that kind of thing. Um, I spend a lot of my time outside of the classroom going to comic cons and large scale conventions and presenting workshops and panels just like this one. I'm really uh, thrilled uh, to be amongst all these amazing creators, industry folks, and teachers. Thanks, Michael. Ronnell? Uh, I am also a teacher from Chicago. Um, I'm currently an administrator in District 218 over in the south side of Chicago uh, in the English department. Um, I have anything to promote, but you know, I'm, I'm also a member of LitX, so I, I guess I'll promote that. Any any uh, Twitter handles we should be following, Mr. Whitaker? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you said it, uh, at Mr. Whitaker on, on Twitter. That's M-I-S-T-E-R. Um, and on Instagram, I am the comic book teacher, so at the comic book teacher. Lucy? Um, my name is Lucy Nisley. I'm a comic artist and author. I have a new book for middle grade students out called Stepping Stones, which is about a kid that has to relocate from the city to the country when her parents split up. Um, so it's, it's not about our current situation, but it applies. There's uh, this sense of displacement and sort of things beyond a kid's control. And um, it's my first middle grade fiction graphic novel of nine graphic novels that I've done, I think. And um, I'm really excited about it. Thanks, Lucy. Lisa. Hi, I'm Lisa Wu, and I'm the founder of Mogul Impact. It's my marketing and business uh, consulting firm. And I've worked with several different publishers. And I was a former teacher. I taught it at Ivy uh school um back in the day um and i recently taught at the Kubert school for business um i've worked currently i'm working with a really great company called magnetic press um that has a lot of really um, educator and librarian friendly books um so they're really expanding that particular area and i'm helping guide them to reach that particular audience that i've also been consulting with uh, AWA Studios and a few other companies as well. Thank you, Lisa and Jason. Hi, Jason Walls. I am a graphic novel um, writer and artist and also a teacher of 20 years. Um, I teach special education uh, for a transitions program. If you don't know what that is, it's 18 to 21 year olds still in public school system, still in special education, still with an IEP. Um, I, my current books are called Last Pick, it's a trilogy. The last one comes out in October, and it's about aliens coming and taking a whole bunch of people off our planet, but leaving behind the ones that are marginalized, um, uh, primarily those labeled with disabilities. Spoiler alert, those are our heroes later on. And I do also want to mention that there is a Common Core curriculum available for Last Pick for any teachers or parents or anyone that needs it, just uh, reach out to me and I'll get it to you for free. Uh, so it's, and uh, you can get a hold of me through any of the social media platforms, Jason W. Walls. So just stick a W in the middle. Except I'm not on TikTok because my students said I'm too old for that. So. 
<laughs> Thank you, Jason. All right, so we're gonna get we're gonna jump right in here. This is a question that uh, we'll start with you, Lisa, and then afterwards, this is one you uh, had some interest in answering for us. And then Ronell, if you could jump onto this one too, because I know you have some experience with using adaptations and, and graphic novels like Romeo and Juliet. So the question from social media was, how do you use a classic adaptation like Romeo and Juliet, uh, just not like a normal novel? And what benefits does the medium add to teaching a book like that? I think when it comes to something like Romeo and Juliet or any of the, the older classic with the, with the language is a little bit different from what the students are familiar with, having a visual there to explain what is actually going on and the context of the particular nuances that you find in things like Romeo and Juliet um, will really help um, readers comprehend the story. So um, even when I was teaching sixth graders and we were teaching the Christmas Carol, you know, there's some really great imagery in there. And sometimes it might be a bit too much for the students to understand, especially sixth graders. Um, and sometimes even drawing it out and showing them what it actually looked like, the particular scene, or having them actually work on it as a group and creating a little comic strip of what's going on helps them really understand like all the different details that the story is weaving so they can understand the, the story a little bit better. So I really like showing visuals and even having the students create the visuals that go along with the text. And it really helps, you know, uh, people, uh, the students themselves actually teach each other as well. So, yeah. I think yeah, it's I had a similar. Anything. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, go ahead. I was just gonna say, I had, I had a similar experience teaching Romeo and Juliet specifically. Um, it was Gareth Hines' uh, adaptation of the book. Um, I mean, there's a couple different reasons or different ways we approach it. I tend to have kids approach it almost like um, film. Um, and when we look at Romeo and Juliet, it's a lot like looking at those characters' performance and a lot of the choices that the creators um, make to kind of say, hey, this is how I want to portray this particular scene. And here's how I want to, you know, uh, convey things visually. There was one really cool moment in my classroom um, where uh, Mercutio is kind of going off on like one of his signature rants and oh. he's like making a pose with, uh, uh, with a sword and uh, Gareth drew his shadow doing something totally different. And like I had my kids like just look at just looking at all the images. I didn't point that out to them. I had a kid bring that to me. I didn't even notice that before. And he was like what's going yeah. on with this? Like, like why is the shadow different? And then another kid was like, well, yeah, maybe it's because, like, he's, like, so moody. Like, he goes back and forth that even, like, his own shadow doesn't follow, like, his performance or what he's doing. And it was like, yeah, that was a really cool thing to, like, all discover together. I and mean, we talked about, like, what the artist does to kind of convey even more information than what the text was trying to. Mm -hmm. Anybody else want to weigh in on that one? Um, it could be... It could be a slippery slope sometimes, though. Um, when it comes to plays, I think because those were meant to be seen, not read necessarily. Shakespeare didn't write, uh, you know, this plays in the 1600s so that he could torture students 400 years later. Um, so he, you know, those were meant to be performed. Um, so the graphic novel medium, I think, lends itself to adaptation in that way. Um, it has to be a really good adaptation if it's if it's cut, even you know, in the case of plays, but. Uh, for example, like something like Jane Eyre or, you know, Huckleberry Finn or whatever, you know, book, you know, you, you're forced to teach to your students that year. Um, it should be it should be something that that has some uh, thematic uh, resonance with the original text. So, I mean, there's that's something that I think teachers need to be aware of. There's a lot of poorly done adaptations in graphic novel form out there that are marketed directly to schools and teachers really cheap. And um, while that can seem, you know, like, hey, we're hip, we're doing graphic novels, uh, very often they can be damaging um, to, you know, the text's intent and the ability for you to teach and study it. So. Oh, definitely. And, and, and um, once you do get a really great version of it, it's really great, like um, you said, that you can kind of compare and contrast and have really great discussions and debates on the interpretation that the author actually takes um, the text too. So I always love those particular discussions 
And I feel like students learn a lot more from the back and forth of analyzing the text and then also the artwork that goes along with it. I want to piggyback off of Michael too and say that the picking a good version is extremely important because you know, you're trying to engage young readers in this medium and show them that there's other ways that you can learn things. And if you're giving them something that is, you know, it's, it's I mean, there's film adaptations of all of Shakespeare's plays as well that aren't very good. And then there's some that are amazing, right? So kind of making sure that you lean, if, if you've never taught with the medium before, you might want to lean on one of your friends who has, or, or reach out to somebody like anybody in this room and say, well, where do I start? And then we can offer up some, some suggestions for you there. So I think that was, that's a pretty good uh, rundown of teaching with the classics. The next question we have here, uh, and this was a big one, this was brought up by uh, at least three different people that reached out to me, was how do you handle the sexual, sexualization of females that is so common in comics, especially when dealing with body image issues? Jason, did you wanna start with that one? You had an interest in answering that one. Sure, yeah. Um, well, as we all know, representation matters. So when you are representing uh, women in comics that look completely unrealistic, you're not only um, making it hard for uh, women to relate to characters in comic books, but you're also teaching readers what, you're leading people to believe that women are supposed to look a certain way and be represented in a certain way. So not only are you not being, are you not representing women, you're actually you know, um, doing a complete disservice to women. Um, I struggled with this. So one of my main characters in the last pick is a 16 year old girl. Uh, she's a twin and she has a brother. Um, and I was, and I also have two boys who um, I really want to grow up uh, good people and to um, be reading a, a diverse cast of characters. So when I was when I was drawing her, I think I first started drawing her um, fairly asexual and maybe even closer to sort of she had the boy's body because I was very nervous about representing in, a, in the wrong way. Um, luckily I had an amazing editor that, um, and she um, worked with me and, and gave me the confidence to just be like, um, it's okay to show her as a woman. And in fact, it's probably not okay to not show her as a woman if that's uh, the kind of character you're trying to represent. So um, I, I worked really hard to, to show her as a 16 year old girl with a realistic uh, sense of self and body. Um, and I, I'd say that especially male creator, creators, if you're not struggling with that as you're doing it, um, you might want to struggle a little bit more. Uh, I don't think it comes easy to a lot of us. We were raised uh, uh, seeing representations of women that um, are oftentimes unrealistic. Lucy, did you have anything you wanted to say about that? Considering I, we have all, a lot of your protagonists are, you know, I've seen yourself in, in the comics and a lot of, especially in uh, the new book, we have a cast of uh, strong women characters. Yeah, it's uh, my, the act of making comics for me has always been about sort of processing the world and finding my place in the world. And so I've always wanted to show me and other people as real, present, honestly depicted human beings in this world. So I was never really interested in kind of the exaggeration of someone's body, of, of making it look unrealistic or cartoonish. And uh, I mean, I grew up in the 90s and read a lot of comics where women did not look like human beings to me. They did not seem like real people. And so it's always been really important for me to both to make and to read comics where where the characters really seem authentic, seem like people that you could meet and know and love. And uh, for me, it really helped me kind of get over that understanding that that's how a woman is supposed to look to be able to draw myself and to read books where women are represented. And how wonderful is it that we now live in a world where you can find so much more representation than you could when I was growing up. And there's so many wonderful books that show um, bodies of all kinds and people of all ages and sizes and races. And it's really just wonderful to see. And I, I hope that that expands. And it's so, um, it's so nice that, that, that 
educators and librarians have access to this work now and that this work is being created? I tend to, like, I don't read a lot of the big two books. Like, I'll, I'll reach out and get uh, a recommendation for a title here and there because I feel like I should stay connected to what Marvel and DC are doing. I read a lot of independent stuff and I read a lot of just graphic novels over single issues if I can. So I don't, I tend to not, if I see body types that are really exaggerated in, 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 in weird sexual ways, like those books will never make it into my classroom. I try, try my best every once in a while. I'm like, a crazy older 1990s Marvel book will make it in my room and I'll, and I'll open it and I'll be like, oh man, this is just like, I don't know what this is, you know, because there's so many great books now that can replace that on my shelf that I replace it and I just, you know, that, that book doesn't Let need to die. be. <laughs> What's that? Let it die. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's it okay. Die. Like there's so many amazing characters that we can let that die. Yeah. Anybody else have any feelings on that idea? Yeah, I, I think I'm just going to kind of chime in and just like really um, reiterate some stuff that y'all kind of said. Like one of the things that I've been really cognizant of is making sure that realistic is the key word there. And realistic doesn't always have to be like, I think sometimes we overcorrect and we go, well, everybody has to be a strong blank character. Everybody has to be a positive character. And I think like mm -hmm. just books with humans in it would be really cool. Like can we start there at baseline first? And then we'll throw in the strong or whatever that goes. So like, I think even when, when, like, when we get to the place where we want to just say, I just want to give kids um, exposure to like all of the experiences that exist out there. And then that way I think they can kind of pick and choose like, yeah, I think I like this thing that fits more to me versus the one that says like everybody who is, you know, a woman has to have this experience. Everyone who is black has to have that experience. I think it's been, I think Lucy kind of hit the nail on the head too. We're in a place now where, as weird as it sounds to say like that, you know, um, comics are more diverse because it's still like such a long way to go. It feels like we're getting a lot more access to stories and creatives that we didn't have when I was a kid. Like, and you know, every, you know, depiction of women in comics was like Psylocke and Rogue and that was in like torn clothes at some point. So like now it's like, it, it's it's a lot more realistic. It's a lot more um, depth. Every character has their own, you know, complexity. I think that that's probably the richest thing that we can experience right now. Cool. Okay. Um, next question, man. We we are blazing through time here. These are great answers. So I'm gonna go to the first question that was on the list, which was from a Twitter user. Do age ranges factor into which material you share, just like with print novels, due to graphic violence in their drawings? So I guess the question to educators would be, how, does the, how do the age ranges factor into what you teach? And the, for the creators would also be, do you think about those things being taught into classrooms when you are creating them? And if so, do you think about the reader's ages as you create? When I was I'm sorry. No, no, Lisa, go ahead. Yeah. Well, when I was a sixth grade teacher, um, I was even though there are certain books that were on the reading list that I was able to teach, there were you have to be very cognizant of the demographic of students and and the parents and, and as well as your school. There are certain titles that um, you will graphic novel or not, you're going to get something coming back to you, even if you think it's a classic or anything like that. So you have to really, just like marketing, you have to know what your audience is and how, how much the kids can actually handle. Um, I had students, I was able to teach Book Thief to my sixth graders um, my first year as a, as a teacher um, at a particular IB school. Um, they were magnet students and the parents loved it. Um, and that was an eighth grader book. And then, <laughs> and then um, for, for that particular group of kids, I was able to even teach things like um, Plato and things like that. And they loved it. And it's something that I didn't teach. It was some kind of, it was a lesson that I wasn't able to get until I was in high school. And then the next class of students, I could not teach those things to. Um, the demographics were different. So you have to keep in mind the age level. Um, I mean, 
the capabilities of that particular group too. Um, I'm always, um, I feel like the school sometimes is always really concerned about what is being taught. <laughs> and um, so I don't know how, 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 how it is currently with teachers are actively teaching in middle school or high school, but even in when I'm teaching college, um, I'm also very careful as well um, about the audience and what I bring to the classroom and see how much they can actually really handle. So, um, is there anybody that's teaching middle school right now? Or high school? I'm sure, I'm sure somebody watching this is probably streaming. Yeah. Like, yes, we are. Uh, <laughs> like, you have to be really careful with those little kids and their parents. Yeah. I feel like there were certain titles I could teach another school that I taught at, but I couldn't at this particular school because of the makeup of the parents and things like that. So, and I actually had a lot of freedom at this school too. So it's kind of interesting. I've, um, I've had run-ins in the past around this and I've had to be very careful when curating my classroom library um, and suggesting books uh, to not just teach, but also uh, suggesting books for summer reading lists and stuff. Um, I find that, uh, you know, Sometimes I want to reach out to artists like Jason and Lucy and others and say, hey, I really want to teach your book, but you put this on this page and this one page of blankets, which has a naked woman or um, of French milk, which has reproductions from the Louvre. Like, I can't put that on my shelf. And I really want to give this to the kids. And, and in some cases, if I get clearance from parents or whatever you know if you you cover your bases you can often like i can't put a killing joke on my on my on my shelf because there is questionable Definitely. material there <laughs> yeah right and but like even like watchmen which everybody like recognizes as this canonical graphic novel that we can't put it on a, i can't have it in my classroom because there's oh. things in there of images um but it's it's because of and i think Nietzsche you touched a little on this the graphic nature i mean not to be you know pulling that that term um the idea that that those pictures can be reproductions of things that parents could get upset about but if it were not a graphic novel if it was just a textual chapter book and that was described it would be less likely to be problematic not that it wouldn't be but it would be less likely because it's not there as an image so um yeah you have to be even at the high school level i mean once you get to college then the game changes but um, when it comes to choosing books for my graphic novel course at the high school, I have to make sure that I'm very careful and I read every book before it's, it okay. could potentially go into the hands of the students. Um, I'm sure everybody here when they were in middle school read The Giver and I think there's graphic versions of it now. And I remember teaching just the, the prose of it and um, the imagery of the needle going into the euthanization of the, the babies was too much. So I can't imagine bringing that book and having the kids actually seeing it and not just being described. So um, that would definitely be a book that I would not bring into the classroom if people in the past have complained about um, just the description of it, so. Um, I, I would be curious. I'm just okay. curious to see if Jason or Lucy to... had any in any experience with like when you're creating your characters for your graphic novels, do you do you guys consider schools? And and if so, what age range you are trying to reach? Or do you not consider that? Do you just make a book for your sake, for the for the story you want to tell, and then kind of let teachers and students and parents decide if they want to read it? Uh, well, for me, the uh, the middle grade book that I did is basically for my 11-year-old self, which I feel like part of me is still 11. So it was easy to to speak to that part of myself. And I didn't, I didn't think about uh, educators, but I did want to make a book for a kid that was maybe going through a divorce or a kid that had, had to move away from their home um, or a kid that was entering into a new family situation uh, the way that I did, because a lot of the books that I was reading 
back then were the giver. And like, as much as I loved that, that didn't really reflect what I was going through. So I really wanted to, um, to make a book that kids could kind of see some aspect of their lives in. Um, and, you know, I, I considered the age range in terms of the language used and the, um, and I guess the, the way that I wanted to depict the characters visually, but I didn't consider how it would be taught, I suppose. Um, yeah, I, I think what, like what Lucy was saying, I, I did a lot of consideration of um, the language used and some of the, the, the themes as far as that goes for the age group. Um, I think for my, for the writing and drawing of my books, it's, I think I'm reacting more to like pop cultures, uh, willingness to have a lot of violence, uh, whether it's TV or film and, and sexuality is really sort of forbidden. Um, so I always have that in my mind that uh, I hate that my kids are going to grow up with that sort of being a thing. Um, so I'm very mindful about both of those. Um, if I'm going to have violence in my books, I needed to have some sort of weight and context to the story. Um, and I'm also trying to, I'm watching the clouds go out my window and I keep getting dark and bright in here, sorry. Um, but I also want to be um, comfortable adding sexuality to my books in a healthy, loving way, um, which I don't know if I really grew up with that in comic books. So um, that's more on my mind. Um, so say like uh, um, the, the graphic novel trilogy, March, I'm pretty comfortable having that in my classroom. Um, there's some horrific scenes of violence in it though, but I feel like it's important and because the context, um, it's important yeah. to have in a classroom. Um, so, and also Stra uh, Strangers in Paradise. I have that in my classroom because I love the sexuality of those books. Um, I think it shows what a really loving relationship can be like. So I'd like for my students to grow up uh, reading some things like that too. Yeah. So one thing that I've been at Magnet Press that I really enjoy, um, their particular YA or middle grades books, is that they they have two books that I really love. One is Irina. It's based on a true story of, um, I'm going to pronounce her last name wrong, but she, she was a hero. She was a nurse um, who actually saved over 2,000 kids. Um, I think 200,000 kids, I think, um, during the Holocaust. And it actually depicts war and um, the brutality of the Holocaust. But in a way, even the art, that it's very respectful, it addresses the issues without it being, I guess, too gruesome. Um, it's definitely something that I would actually recommend in the classroom because it addresses, it, it's based on real life um, and addresses really tough issues it's written by these French creators that actually did a lot of research um, all around Europe um, to write it, and it's fantastic. Um, it's it's really hard um, to depict to do to do something like that the creators did, where it addresses war, uh, the dehumanization of a whole group of people, and um, in a way that it's not. Gary, <laughs> which is um, to, to that particular age group, and it's, it's pretty amazing. And um, another book, too, that is especially important to me, um, because I am Chinese-American, um, is The Battle of Yaya, and I was surprised. It has, like, this Ghibli art, you know, happy little figures as the main characters, and they're going through the Battle of Shanghai, which most people don't know about. Um, the Battle of Shanghai, and it's about friendship. And they go through things like seeing soldiers and going through this journey to make their way to Hong Kong to get away and find their parents. But it's like, they, they find pirates and they find all sorts of, it addresses child abuse in there too, because one, one of the uh, main characters is kind of like a street urchin little kid and gets kind of batted around, but it addresses those things without it being scary or to the point that I feel like parents would not complain about it because you can address the issue. It's based on history and um, it's just drawn in such detail and um, 
restraint um, that I feel like most parents and kids would really be drawn to it. You know, Lisa, at least I'm glad you brought that up. The, the idea of these topics being important, powerful topics being covered yeah. in a way that's approachable. So Ronell, the question is to you as somebody who we've had this conversation so many times, you're a little bit more like liberal about what you would put in the classroom, maybe over me. And we have these debates, all the very healthy debates. How do you overcome pushback? How do, as an administrator, because one of the questions we get all the time, and it was here as well, was dealing with pushback from like as a through a, a administrator's perspective a parent or another teacher who may push back on something how do we how do we deal with that and how do we stress the comic the, the benefit of comics even those that are hard hitting in the classroom i uh, i'm a first year administrator i actually dealt with uh, quite a few challenges this year for text and you know it always came down to a couple of things like um was the the reason for the challenge like was this text salacious in its treatment of the topic right uh, which that's not going to be an issue for anything that we have in our our uh, library so then the question becomes well is this a topic that perhaps wasn't approached the right way in this classroom and approached with this text the right way and there's always going to be the question of like well could i do the same thing with a different text so I think I'll start there. Like one of the things that I've always tried to do is be really mindful of like if if there's a, a specific kind of thing I want kids to learn and there's this great text that can address it, but it has some objectionable things in it. Can I find an analog or is this specific work of art necessary to use to hammer her home this point? It was funny hearing like Michael talk about like some of the books that he uh couldn't have and I was like oh snap we have that in our, in our library and in our like our curriculum like Watchmen is all up and through there um and it's just funny it's like I, I think the biggest thing that I've tried to lean in on is really establishing trust and community not only in your classroom but with your parents like I was able to get away with a lot of stuff when I was in the classroom mainly because like my parents just loved the fact that I was the teacher that you know their kids came home and talked about what we read and talked about what we did in fact they were talking about reading and writing yeah. and i think the stuff that that parents will forgive if it's like oh but like my kid hasn't read a book in four years and now my kid's reading a book so i you know i th there's always this again there's always this like kind of give and take with this topic i've always not challenged parents but just tried to say you know we have to try our best to keep an open mind and if there is a thing that you have a problem with I am more than willing to, to be sensitive about that. But at the same time, you know, my question is always going to be like, where, where has the work happened on your end as well? Like, what, what have we read together? Maybe ask your student about this book and see where their head is with it. And maybe you don't want to have conversations about certain things just yet. But I don't know, man. Most of the stuff I've had have been like, you know, 15 to 18 year old kids. So if you're 18 year old kid, or if you think your 18 year old kid doesn't know about sex, I got some things to tell you about that. Um, yeah. But no, I mean, you know, I, I, I think the, the, I just lean back on, on the community part, man. Like, I, as long as, as parents are involved and aware and they, you know, they're able to at least have that voice, then I think you'll be okay. So, so far, it, it's been fine for me. And even when I had like um, the, the challenge this year, I was able to talk the parent off the ledge in a way that was like, listen, the, environment in that classroom is very safe and if it doesn't feel safe to you then that's a different conversation we'll have with you and that teacher but mm -hmm. i've observed it and I, I welcome you to come up like i mean i think it's all about being open and like bringing that person okay. in on it and then once they they know like i'm not trying to like sneakily you know indoctrinate your kids we're just having a discussion that needs to be had or reading a text that maybe needs to be read i think it's fine also to to lisa's point um, I don't know, man. I don't like the idea that we're okay with teaching regular texts that do worse things than a graphic novel does. So it, it sometimes is a sore spot for me that yeah. most of the texts that we teach high school kids are adult books. But if I want to give them a graphic novel, they're like, well, no, it's got to be Spider-Man or nothing. I'm not 
kind of surprised what Michael said that he wasn't able to have a book that had classical artwork from the Louvre. <laughs> there, there are parents who will who will challenge that, and then you have to kind of like laugh to yeah. yourself and then go. I never right, had. How do I handle this? <laughs> <laughs> Look up Laurent Jean de Mond. It's a painting in the Louvre that I depicted in French milk in my book, and it's. It's not just a tasteful nude. I'll just say that. <laughs> okay. okay. That actually, that actually <laughs> was. Um, I, I would imagine that Michael's referring to some tasteful thing. No, it, it was oh. that. It was that book, but. Um, it was that book. See, that actually, that that actually happened because we put French milk on the summer reading list on my recommendation, and I didn't think anything of it because it was re it was rep repro reproductions of classic art hanging in the greatest museum in the, on the planet. Yeah. So I'm like, okay. But um, another teacher saw a student reading it and it happened to be open to that page and it was addressed. Um, it was fine. I mean, we, uh, we had to take it off the list, um, unfortunately, after that. But um, Wait, yeah. You said I mean, a, teacher, a teacher saw that? A teacher. A, another teacher who has since retired. Uh, um, a teacher's um, a hater. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't know. I mean, very beautiful I, painting. I don't want to bad. Yeah. I don't want to bad mouth my former colleagues, but I mean, it was, it was what it was. What it was, and 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 to, I mean, I want to make it clear. Like, I would never have the conceit to go to someone like Lucy or Jason or any other artist and say, change this page so I can use it with my students. You're not. You're not writing your books, and I think Lucy, you said it best. You're writing the stories that that like that was for your eleventh, your eleven year old self. Like you're not, you shouldn't have to think about censoring or changing or modifying your vision in order to fit into the school mold. That's not at all um, what, I, what I would want as an appreciator of books or as a teacher. Um, but like then there's another book, Scarecrow, uh, Scarecrow Princess by, um, yeah, it's a Lion it's Forge Lion book by Forge European. Down magnetics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it, it has, it's an amazing book, but it has, it, suddenly the main character is a woman and she's naked so I can't I, I can't risk the fact that this might cause problems um, right. with, within my school not just for me but for my department chair and my district and my principal so um, you know while I would love to use that book I can't but I would never ever go back to the artist and say can I oh, take no. a sharpie and cross it like I that's just not even an option and so this is, um, it's this, just, that's when I when I send kids to the library I say, yeah. like, man, it's a, <laughs> right. it'd be a it'd be a real shame if this this book fell into your book bag after you checked it out. <laughs> All right, we are uh, this this has been a lot of fun. We're running out of time, so I'm going to have a question. I'm going to actually ask each of you to answer it, uh, and I'm going to combine two of our final questions into one. Uh, one of the questions from an educator was, "Any favorites you like to teach that you want to mention?" And then another question was any long running story arcs or graphic novels you recommend to teach social issues, racism, addiction, LGBTQ rights, or addiction? I know that's a huge question, but if you even wanted to use your own books or books that you've read in the past, titles that you think would pop be powerful, I'd like each of us to share, just quickly share two or three titles that you think would be good. And while you think about them, I'll go first. I'll share my title so you can kind of um, mill it over a little bit. I think my, three go-tos would have to be, um, I loved teaching and I still love teaching I, uh, I Kill Giants. That is such a, the, the ending of that book is so powerful and wonderful that uh, I've had students move to tears reading the end of that book in class. We never read that together. We all, I always let the students read that and kind of take it in on their own. Uh, Everyone's an Alien When You're an Alien by Johnny Sun. I think the simplicity of that book is an amazing entry into the genre of comics and graphic novels. And it also teaches kids that they don't have to be an amazing artist to create story, to, to create, you know, sequential art. And, and I think that book is probably my second go-to. And then for my third one, um, I'm going to mention a book. I think, I think Jason mentioned it earlier, uh, March, probably I'm going to, I'm not stepping on any toes here, but the March series, Andrew Iden, John Lewis, Nathan Powell. That is such a, an amazingly wonderful book about the life and times of John Lewis. So those would be my three. I Kill Giants, Everyone's an Alien When You're an Alien, and March. Anybody want to volunteer to go second? You stole two of mine. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I go first. <laughs> so 
Well, I already mentioned um, the Bow of Yaya, and I really think it should be taught in schools because it's a very powerful story, and I feel like it depicts um, colonial um, Shanghai really, really well, art-wise, and the melding of cultures, like even in the scenery and the background. I mean, you can have a whole discussion on the first couple of intro pages because of the just the, the setup of the room. Um, you can have so many cross curriculum, you know, discussions and lesson plans involved in it from history, science, art, definitely literature. Um, but it's really amazing this blending of cultures inside one little book and so beautifully drawn. It touches on it. One thing that I did find about Line Forge and also Magnetic Press, they actually were um, in part of the same company, actually. Um, is that they take books that are from all over the world that have been very much successful all over the world and they translate it to the uh, English. So you're getting a broad global perspective, not just within the book, but just with also the creators too and their, their various like backgrounds. It, it's pretty fascinating. Um, and I always love being able to teach more than just English in one book, you know, so. Which two, which two did I steal from you? Um, I kill giants in March. Okay. <laughs> did you, did you want to throw one more on top of the list? Then, uh, um, I think I'm good. Okay. <laughs> Jason, you want to take the mic here? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, Strangely, the, the comics that I use the most in my classroom, um, you're all familiar with the anthology series Flight? Mm -hmm. um, oh, yeah. So those are super helpful in the classroom for a lot of reasons. One of them, it's very low text, sometimes no text at all. Um, so we can have a lot of fun with that. Uh, students that really have str uh, struggled reading can mm -hmm. still participate in the story and uh, the storytelling of it. Then I also have them write in their own uh, talk bubbles to create their own for them and create their own stories with that. So we use that a bunch. Um, but uh, some of the staples in there, it's uh, American Born Chinese. Every year I find five to 10 students that are just blown away by that one. Um, oh, yeah. So that's a big one. I would say uh, Lumber James is pretty popular. Um, uh, what do we think? Oh, X-Men. I use X-Men a lot, which is funny because I didn't grow up reading X-Men. But um, I've taught enough classes now to where there's an X-Men story that works really well for just about anything you're teaching, especially when it comes to civil rights history. Um, so I find that to be a really cool one to work with. Oh, and Miss Marvel is a really good gateway comic for people that don't read comics. Yeah, it took years, I could tell. <laughs> but it's uh, my students who have never read a comic or a superhero comic, um, they're really digging that. And it's so fun. So. Thank you. All right, I'm, I'm done being nice because uh, I, I keep losing books. So um, I, I want to co-sign Lumber James because um, it, it does my favorite thing where it, um, it presents characters who are, you know, um, trans, you know, characters or uh, gay characters or, you know, or queer characters in general. And it's just um, characters of color. And it's in this world where people are just like, it's not like a big deal. It's like, that's just who this person is. And I don't need to have the big coming out moment. And, and it's not to say that there aren't, there's a value in some of those stories, but I think that we might be to a place now where we can start to have more accepted um, people from, from different groups. So I think that's one of the things I love about that book. Uh, but um, I was not ignoring people. I was literally going through my list and like checking them off as I was saying them. So uh, one that I, I'm a, I'm a broken record, but I'm going to keep selling this book, man. The current Wonder Twins run is freaking amazing for this kind of stuff. The first four issues literally are like satire about the prison industrial complex. Hmm. And it's great. And it gives you a really easy access point to those topics um without the um i don't know i hate to say like without the tragedy of it but like giving kids a way to to access that topic 
in a way that doesn't necessarily, you know, turn into any kind of, um, you know, tragedy porn for some people. Uh, then, so that, that book is great. Um, I think Mark Russell does a great job with that kind of stuff. And anything he does. Uh, ooh, another one that I think is really good. Man, y'all kept taking my stuff. Like I was thinking I was going to do one and then got taken away. Uh, buh, 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 buh. Oh, you know what? Like your black friend is very good. There's a little bit of language in there, but Ben Passmore is um, really good at just like putting things out there in a way that's blunt, but also palatable um, in a sense that like, yo, you have to deal with this issue. And I, I think it's, um, I think it's a really powerful way to kind of depict the stuff. And again, I'm, I'm talking mainly for like high school age kids. So mm -hmm. that, that one might, that one might be tough for like your, your, your fifth grader. Uh, I think that might have to be it for me, man. Like, I think I lost quite a few of them. I was looking at as the crow flies would be a good one, I think to throw in, um, as well and i'm gonna stop and leave some books for y'all to talk about <laughs> <laughs> lucy michael who would like to go i'll go um so uh a friend of mine erica moen is coming out with a book called let's talk about it which is about um it's like aimed towards high schoolers and it's this really great exhaustive um instructional book about relationships and sex which i think is really good um and it's 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 really cool it's not out yet but it's coming um obviously hey kiddo by jared kreska which deals with addiction and uh, parental addiction problems is like really important and i think uh can help a lot of kids um there's a uh, laura dean keeps breaking up with me is a great lgbt love story aimed for high school readers which um is just it's like really nice to kind of see uh, the characters work through relationships and understand what's healthy and what's not. Um, uh, I also really liked uh, Not Quite American Girl, which uh, was about um, a, an, a, a Korean American immigrant and her sort of learning to uh, navigate coming to America. I really enjoyed that one. Um, and these are all relatively new books that have come out in the last few years, and it's, it's cool to see how great they are. Thank you. Michael, you're going to bring us on with some good oh. ones that we haven't mentioned yet? Yeah, you guys took like 90% of my list, but that's okay. I read a lot. Um, uh, I love teaching Pride of Baghdad. Um, oh. I mean, I was going to say Ms. Marvel Volume 1, but um, that one was taken by Jason. But uh, Pride of Baghdad is a book that I teach. Uh, you know, it's about, uh, anth not anthropomorphic, but animals that can talk. And it's during the uh, Operation Desert, Desert Storm, uh, when the walls of the Baghdad Zoo were bombed and the, the animals escaped into the city. And it's kind of a, um, like a war survivor tilled through the eyes of four lions. Um, so it's based in truth, obviously not entirely, but um, it's very impactful. It's, it's very serious and very real. And uh, my students hate the ending. Um, <laughs> read it, you'll know why. Um, as far as like teaching race and and, and uh, gender and uh, sexual orientation, um, I am Alfonso Jones by Tony Medina um, and um, Stacy Robinson. Um, it's about a young boy, um, African American boy, who is buying a suit because his father is getting out of jail and he's going to wear the suit and he's holding the hanger and there's a report of a shooting and the cops rush into the, uh, the store and he's shot and killed and his spirit goes to a subway where the spirits of other African-Americans who were killed um, by police are um, stuck. Um, and it's like about him coming to terms with his own death and then the people who are left behind coming to terms with his death. And it's, it's hard to read without crying, uh, personally. Uh, I also really like, um, I mean, Archival Quality is one. Kiss Number no. 8 by Colleen A.F. Venable was one of my favorite books last year of all time. Um, and it doesn't hurt that Colleen is an amazing person. Um, uh, on top of it, it's, it's a, another book that will teach you about coming of age and uh, coming out um, in a way that I think that is palatable to middle school and uh, high school students. Um, they Call This Enemy by George Takei. Um, amazing yeah. book. And I was fortunate enough to actually... Uh, working for a com Comic-Con, I got to meet him and talk to him about the book. Um, and he's just a lover of education, uh, a lover of um, 
of activism. Um, it's just all around an amazing person. Uh, and his book is equally as amazing. And then as far as one last one I want to mention is Tomboy by Liz Prince, which taught me a lot about gender identity and sexuality, um, being someone that wasn't really in growing up exposed to a lot of, of that. I was, you know, it was pretty straightforward for me. And that kind of opened my eyes. It was the first book that really made me go, oh, wow, I'm starting to understand it. Um, and it's a great book to put in the hands of students, uh, I think as well. So those are my choices. Thank you all for sharing those. I just want to say. Ah, real fast, real fast. Oh, right now, go ahead, yeah. <laughs> Come on. Um, Cardboard Kingdom for younger, younger kids would be great. Um, a lot of yeah. different cool identity uh, things in there. Dope book and like a really good entry point for younger kids. Uh, one we just read um, is uh, Superman Smashes the Clan. Love it. Amazing book. I think Jin Yang does a really great job of, um, I think, kind of addressing the current climate that we're in in 2020 uh, by using a, a book that's set in the 1930s. Hmm. Hmm, uh, Chad, also, Doodleville that mm -hmm. just came out. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, 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 haven't, I haven't read that one yet. Um, it's really good. <laughs> okay, I'm going to have to write that down. And then lastly, it's not a comic book, but I talk about it all the time because it just blew me away. And it's um, Jason Reynolds' Miles Morales' Spider-Man. It's a, it's oh, a, yeah. a, a, mm -hmm. a prose book. Um, but if you ever wanted to get kids to read like a really deep exploration of race without knowing they're doing it, um, that is the book to do it. He was at ALA last year, right? Yeah. Jason Reynolds is probably at ALA every year because he's like the <laughs> man. <laughs> but he, he, I think he might have been featured. He's a speaker, like that I think. Year. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, last thing, I'll, I'll, last comment before I thank you all for being here today. For, well, thank you. I'll thank you now. I'll thank you again for kind of having this conversation with us for these educators out here at Comic-Con at home, the AMA panel, uh, Comic-Con International panel. A lot of the authors and a lot of the creators and the writers, one of the great things about comics and graphic novels is that they're they're current, they're living, they're available, they're on social media. I have taken students to go see G. Willow Wilson. I have taken students to go see Johnny Son at a bookstore. And those experiences with those kids meeting authors of books that we read have been amazing. So I'm gonna encourage all the educators out there to reach out, to reach out. You know, uh, Gareth Hines, who did the Romeo and Juliet book for a, a very minimal charge. He'll Skype with your kids and ask, answer questions. I mean, it doesn't hurt to ask, to reach out on social media or the artist authors websites and ask if they'd be willing to talk with your students and it, it's been an amazing resource so once again I want to I want to thank Jason Lucy Lisa Michael and Ronell for being with us here today it was an amazing conversation with you all and I want to tell everybody to have a great weekend here and um, it sucks we can't be at Comic-Con together but hopefully this will help some educators and librarians and people looking to learn some new things about comics so thank you all thank you thanks for having us thank you Bye, Comic-Con. Okay. All right. All right. Fun. Thank you so much.